Discovery of viruses cannot be attributed to a single person, but it has been a joint contribution of a team of scientists, including Dutch, German, and Russian microbiologists. It was the Russian microbiologist Ivan Whisky who in 1892 used the filter devised by Charles Chamberlain in 1866 to trap smallest possible bacteria that were supposed to cause the disease in the tobacco plants called as tobacco mosaic disease. It was Bijernik from 1851 to 1932 who deserves the credit of first realizing that the causative agents of tobacco mosaic disease differ considerably from microorganisms. And Stanley in 1935 first crystallized the viruses and proved that viruses have both living and non-living attributes which opened a debate on their nature whether they are living or non-living or on the borderline of the two. Bacteriophages, that is the viruses which infect bacteria, were first discovered by a French scientist D. Harrell in 1970, while Schelsinger in 1933 first determined the chemical composition of a virus. Harshay and Chase in 1952 were the first to demonstrate that the genetic information is carried in the phage DNA and they have to infect the host cells for transmission of this information. The important and pioneering contribution by these microbiologists guided the way forward for the recent advances in the field of virology. Evolution of viruses is still an intriguing question and three hypotheses have been put forward to explain their origin and evolution. They include first, viruses because of simplicity of their genome might represent the direct descendants of earlier self-replicating units in the primordial soup from which the first cells evolved and then co-evolved to give rise to the complex life forms. Second. Viruses evolved from free living organisms that invaded other life forms and gradually lost their function. This is also known as retrogressive theory of evolution. Third, viruses are escaped nucleic acids no longer under the control of their host cells. This is also called as the escape gene theory of viral evolution. While all these theories or hypotheses partly contribute to the understanding of the viral evolution, a unifying concept to explain the same is yet to emerge. All viruses have two basic structural components. The core nu of nucleic acids, what comprises their genome, and a capsid, that is the shell-like covering around this genome. The two together, genome plus capsid, comprise the genocapsid. So far the genome of viruses is concerned, they are too flexible in this and employ all four possible types including single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, or double-stranded RNA. Single-stranded DNA mm -hmm. 
for example, parvoviruses, double-stranded DNA, for example, lambda farts, single-stranded RNA, as is found in tobacco mosaic virus or chrome mosaic virus and double-stranded RNA as in retrovirus. Capsid is a coat of nucleic acids surrounding the genome which is composed of capsomers, the protein subunits, the number of which as I told earlier also is species specific and an important taxonomic criteria. Some viruses do have an envelope, lipoproteinaceous covering around the uh, capsid, what are called as enveloped viruses. Viruses can be broadly classified into three morphological types, including icosahedral, helical, and the complex. Icosahedral, or a typical icosahedron, is a polyhedron with 12 vertices in 20 equilateral triangles as faces. The capsomers in the icosahedron viruses are composed of protomers, which may be either pentamers, that means with five protein subunits or hexamers with six protein subunits. The best examples of icosahedral viruses include adenoviruses, polioviruses, and canine parvoviruses. Helical viruses are basically the rod-shaped, long, hollow cylinders with linear array of nucleic acids and protein subunits making up the capsid. In such viruses, for example, tobacco mosaic virus, the protein subunits are arranged in a helical spiral with genome fitted into a groove on the inner portion of the protein. The size of the helical capsid is influenced both by its protomers and the nucleic acids enclosed within the capsid. So for the complex types of viruses are concerned, these are the viruses that are assembled from the parts that are synthesized separately, that means head, tail or the capsomers come from the different parts and they do not fit either into the helical or into the icosahedral symmetry and as such are called as complex in their morphology and bacteriophages or pox viruses are the best examples of complex viruses. An interesting thing to know is how do viruses replicate? Viral replication differs in different types of viruses, but the broad sequence of events in different types of viruses are almost the same. The five principal stages involved in the process of viral replication include adsorption, penetration, synthesis of viral nucleic acids and the proteins, and assembly or maturation of the virion particles and finally their release. So for the attachment or the adsorption is concerned, this is the first step in the viral replication which generally takes place through random collision of virion, virion particles with the host cell surfaces, facilitated by the specific receptor proteins on the host cell membrane or even attached by the ionic interactions. Then the penetration of viruses so far is concerned, it refers to the entry of viruses into the host cell followed by their uncoating, that means the removal of the protein coat surrounding them 
through the activity of proteolytic enzymes. After their penetration into the host cell, the next step is replication or the multiplication of the viral genome. And different viruses have different strategies for the multiplication of this genome. Once abundant viral genome and the proteins and the other components of their capsules are synthesized within the host cell, the important step is their assembly, which is the fourth important step in their replication. And after they are assembled within the host cell, finally the step is the release. That is, viruses, mature viron particles have to get released from the host cells Graphica. The word has come from the Greek word which has the meanings of archaeo, that is the history, pteryx means the feathered organism, litho is the word from the rocks and graphica is the impression of the fossil remains of this bird that we have got on the fossil or on the rock. This Archaeopteryx lithographica fossil was seen in the year 1861 in a place called Bavaria in Germany by Andres Wagner. This organism called Archaeopteryx lithographica is considered to be a connecting link between reptiles and birds. Why we call it as connecting link? Because this organism has both the characters of reptiles as well as that of a bird. The reptilian characters of this organism are number one, this organism had scales on body as well as on its legs. This organism had non pneumatic bones that means the bones in this organism were tougher and stronger and heavier which is not the case with the modern birds. The organism also had jaws and the jaws in them were having the homodont dentition which is again not the case with the modern birds but is the reptilian character in them. The organism called Archaeopteryx also had got long tail with 20 free vertebrae which is again not the case with the modern bird. The organism again had got long cervical vertebrae that means the neck vertebrae and the number of these range from 9 to 10 which is much less than the modern birds. The centrum of the vertebra in this organism were emphysilis that is flat on both sides whereas in the modern birds we have got heterocelous vertebrae uh, which provides flexibility to their vertebra. The vertebral column were having vertebrae which were free and they were not fused which is not the case with the modern birds which have got the fused vertebral column comparatively. The thoracic ribs were also of that of the reptilian type. The sternum in this organism that is the breastbone was not shaped like that of a keel or boat. The forelimbs were having hand, hands and were having three free digits which again are not seen in case of the modern birds. Carpals that is the wrist bones and metacarpals that is the palm bones were free in Archaeopteryx. Pelvic girdle was like that of a reptile and the brain in Archaeopteryx was also very simple like that of a reptile. What were the avian features found in case of Archaeopteryx? Number one and very important feature was that the body of Archaeopteryx was supposedly having the feathers on its spot on it. Uh, particularly the feathers were the contour feathers that is the feathers that are present on the general body the wings were also present in this organism and the 
what you call as flight feathers, that is remiges, were also found in this organism. The tail feathers, that is rectrices, were also found in the fossils of Archaeopteryx. The skull is monocondylic, that is has got only one joint with the vertebral column. And again, this is an advanced feature like that of a bird. The jaws were modified into a beak-like and uh, beak-like structure, which is again the feature of the bird. But it was having teeth on it. That is the reptilian feature. The clavicles, that is the shoulder bones. Here we have clavicles. They were uh, modified into a V-shaped furcula which is an advanced feature and is found in birds as well and other features also were there like that of a bird because of the presence of these the mix of reptilian and the bird like features we say that archaeopteryx is a connecting link between reptiles and birds now let me talk about the feathers which are also called as the nature's masterpieces the word nature masterpieces were provided to them by a well-known ornithologist that is young. Now, feathers are unique to the uh, birds only and the study of the distribution of feathers in the birds is referred to as pterilosis. Pterilosis is the study of distribution of feathers on the body of the bird. Terry J or Terry Lay is the area where the feathers are present and Apterilay or Aterilay is the area where feathers are not found in the body. Like say for example, feathers are not seen on the claws and the hind limbs, particularly beyond the in the in the shank region of that particular organism. So this region is referred to as aterile region. Again, in case of vultures, we see that the skull area and the neck area is not having feathers on it. And we call that region as aterile region. It has been seen that in one of the uh, uh, dinosaurs or reptilian, which is referred to as Coelosaurus, its fossils were found in the Chinese plateau called Leoning area. The fossils of this particular reptile were seen to have feather-like structures. Thus, at present, the feathers are characteristics to birds, but maybe some 100 million to 150 million years ago, the feather-like structures were also found in case on reptiles. Thus, we say that the birds have got feathers from the reptilian ancestry. Feathers are the lightest possible structure present in the body of the bird, but they are very strong structures made up of a protein called keratin, which is different from the keratin found in case of reptiles and other organisms. This keratin is a waterproof structure and waterproof protein and provides the insulation both against the water and the heat. The structure of the feather is very peculiar and has very important function to perform that is insulation and flight. Now let me talk about the structure of the feather. The structure of the feather can be understood under two heads. Number one is the excess. The axis of the feather consists of a small region which is referred to as the calamus and the region which is present in the broader area of the feather which is referred to as rachis. The calamus region is semi-transparent made up of keratin again and it has got two openings on the lower side and one opening at the region of the broad where the broader area starts. This lower area is this lower opening is referred to as the inferior umbilicus and the opening on the upper side of it is referred to as superior umbilicus. These two openings are very important 
and the calamus region is again of great importance the calamus region of the feather is attached with the follicle of the integument and through the inferior umbilicus the blood vessels the nerves and other structures get into the feather for the purpose of the nourishment and also for the purpose of uh, you know uh, movements also and they make it very sensitive structure it is to the calamus that the muscles of the dermis are attached which help in the movement of the feathers also the broader area of the feather is referred to as vein and the rachis is like like a very small line present in the vein this rachis is polygonal in out in transverse section and it has got an mid uh, ventral groove along the entire length of the rachis the vein is having number of bristle like structures which we call as barbs and on the barbs arise on both sides on upper surface and lower surface the barbules these barbules have interlocking mechanism and because of this interlocking mechanism found in the barbs we get a structure which helps the birds to fly up to now i have talked about the birds the study of birds i gave you the characteristics that are peculiar to birds i also talked to, told you that they were called as glorified reptiles by huxley i gave you a brief idea about the evolution of birds in my next course of lecture that is part 2 of this lecture i'll be talking about the type of feathers and the flight adaptations in birds thank you very much mm -hmm.